theme of Proverbs 11, talking about wickedness and righteousness. There's plenty of that here. There's also a, a lot discussed about the foolish person, uh, contrasted with the wise man. Uh, several verses about work ethic and sloth, and a few about the seat. And from all those themes, there's one verse that just kept sticking out to me, and that's verse 4. Perhaps it's because um, we sort of had a theme going in the last several weeks. We had the contentious woman a couple weeks ago. Last week, uh, we had the strange woman in Proverbs chapter 5. And uh, Proverbs 12 mentions the virtuous woman. I thought this would be a great contrast from last week. Uh, verse 4 says, A virtuous woman is a crown to her husband, but she that maketh ashamed is as rottenness in his bones. And I want to point out that, you know, there's a lot that can be learned from the marriage relationship about other relationships like partnerships in business or ways we interact with one another, people who help each other out. But there's nothing like the marriage relationship. That is something special that God has given us. And there's nothing like a virtuous woman to be someone's wife. Nobody else except for a woman can fulfill that need in the marriage relationship. Anything else is a fraud and a perversion. Now, uh, I wanted to point out some cross-references in Proverbs 31. As you know, Proverbs 31 talks about the virtuous woman. In verse 11, it says, The heart of her husband does safely trust in her, so that he shall have no need of spoil. And so we, we see that there's a trust in this marriage relationship because this husband's wife is virtuous. He doesn't have to, have to wonder whether she's going to be supporting him, if she's going to be there for him. There's no question there. It is a matter of trust, and he safely trusts. He doesn't maybe trust, sort of trust part of the time. This is a safe trust. He doesn't have to be on his guard, as so many that live outside the marriage relationship always wonder, well, will that person I'm, I'm with be there for me tomorrow? Marriage protects against that. And uh, also in Proverbs 31, verse 23, it says, Her husband is known in the gates when he sitteth among the elders of the land. What does that have to do with the virtuous woman? Well, quite simply, she's there backing up her husband. She is helping him to put his best fo foot forward to be a leader among men. Being in the gate at that time meant this, this man was one of the elders of the city. He was well respected. Why? Because he had a virtuous woman behind him, beside him, helping him through life. And back in Proverbs 12, verse 4, that's contrasted with the wife who makes ashamed. And uh, Proverbs doesn't play around with analogies. This is a powerful one here in verse 4. But she that maketh ashamed is as a rottenness in his bones. Immediately that brought to mind, in a modern day, bone cancer that just saps the life out of its victims. The marrow in the bones, the blood, has cancer in it. And that person has rottenness in his bones. And can you imagine a, a man who has a wife he can't trust in that's not virtuous, that goes off and does something that he says, oh, no, no, not again. He can't be that kind of man who stands up, who's a leader, because he's, he's held back by the spouse who is not virtuous. So what can we take away from this in Proverbs today? First of all, each of us should strive to be virtuous and to praise God and glorify God in our lives. Um, Secondly, there's nothing like the marriage relationship. That is something special and sacred that God has given to us. Those of you who are married who do have a virtuous spouse, thank God for that person. Those of you who are not married, take your time. As we learned a few weeks ago, it's better to live in the corner of a housetop uh, than to have to uh, be with a contentious woman. You want to wait on God's time for that virtuous person in your life. Uh, with that, Let's thank God for this proverb. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the wisdom that you've given us in the book of Proverbs. Thank you for the opportunity to look at this. Thank you for the virtuous woman in this church and in the lives of their husbands. We thank you so much for them and help us to respect and love them and for the gift that you've given us. I pray that you bless the rest of this service and John as he speaks. In Jesus' name, amen. Children are dismissed for Children's Church. And I guess I see that all the uh, elderly people are the ones who read the bulletins. Uh, they all recognize pastor is out, so they skip town. Uh, but no, we, we recognize that a lot of them do have uh, uh, some ailments that God has allowed into their lives. And I do trust that you pray for them uh, because prayers are effective uh, and they do need those and it can improve their quality of life. And I believe that. Um, so today, 
you know, as, as anytime I get a chance, you know, I've had a couple chances now to be able to fill the pulpit for Pastor Dickman. You know, I always pray because, you know, my default, like on Wednesday nights, we're going through Isaiah. We're going through, you know, things God's trying to tell you when you're not listening. And I like that. I like being able to go through a book, verse by verse, chapter by chapter. You know, I can't really do that, you know, in, in just, you know, random one-off Sunday. Uh, because I would feel, you know, like this need to, you know, lay out all the background for the book. And my sister was giving me some grief for that. Uh, she said, I'm going to turn to, uh, I know some of you know stuff at PCC. She said, I'm going to turn to into Dr. Mullinex, where I just have to constantly give the background and, and all the history of why is this here? What's the theme of the book? You know, it's like, but Heather, you know, they can't understand you know, the meaning of, of this paragraph unless they understand the greater context. But I get in trouble for that. So I was just praying. I was like, God, what do you want me? To speak on and God has directed me to probably one of the deepest passages in Scripture it is one of the most theologically dense uh, sections of the Bible you know it's not one of those ones that the commentators will just skip over and not mention almost everyone co like makes commentary about it they talk about it uh, but there is so much commentary and, and so often there is, there is so little understanding and recognition of it, but I, I feel confident uh, that everyone here is going to be able to keep up with this because um, we are going somewhere deep. So with that said, I'd like you to turn your Bibles to John chapter 3. Uh, we're going to be looking at one verse, uh, one of the deepest verses in all of Scripture. I'm going to go ahead and read it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but of everlasting life. And because of the tremendous depth and density and richness of this verse, I'm only going to be focusing on one specific aspect. Now, the, the reason I'm focusing on, on what I'm going to be focusing on is that, to a degree, so much of our understanding of, of Scripture and, and what we get is, you know, it's based on, you know, teaching and training we get. And it just so happens, as, you know, God has placed requirements in Scripture, it is, you know, men who are the, the preachers and we get to, you know, get up and teach it. Not that there are no ladies' Bible studies and not that uh, anyone who grew up in a Christian home, the majority of what they know is probably comes from their mom. But because it's usually men that teach stuff and that are the theologians and write the books, the brain of a man and a woman works differently. Now, now God's beyond gender, but, you know, we recognize that, you know, I, I grew up, I was homeschooled. My dad went off to work, and I have two sisters and my mom. I'm outnumbered. And what I figured out is that I will never figure it out. I'm sure you can all give testimony to that. But you go, you, you, you go to some random guy, go to his garage, and what are you going to find? He has tools, they're in a toolbox. He has... He has, uh, you know, does any fishing, he's going to have a tackle box that's going to have a place where he has the different kinds of baits, he's going to have it all divided. Maybe he has it by color, I have no idea, um, whatever it is, but it's going to be divided up. My dad, he has uh, a drawer in his room that, you know, there's like clothes and stuff, but he has a drawer for like, you know, fix it kind of tools for stuff around the house. And in that drawer, no other drawer has this, no clothing drawer has this, in that drawer with the tools. He specifically went out and bought these little subdividers, you know, pieces of wood that just block it off into little boxes. See, we like to do that. You know, as a guy, I want to put things in a box, in a little box. And we have done that to the love of God. And preachers will get up and they'll look at it for God so loved the world. There's a God kind of love. And, you know, there's, there's, there's a brotherly fellowship kind of love. And then over here, we have, you know, parental kind of love. And then we have, you know, this kind of, and, and we'll go and do this. But what does it say? It says, for God so loved the world. He's God. Within him, it, you know, elsewhere, in, you know, First John is going to say God is love. He contains everything that is love. And so today... Uh, with, with what God's laid on my heart, I'm going to present to you what we can learn about God's love from our understanding of human affection. Now, the reason I feel there's a need for this is that is probably the one aspect of love which preachers never talk about or associate with God. We completely write it off as something that is unrelated and part of human frailty and empty and has little to nothing to do with God. But we realize that is something natural. That is something that God made in us. And that is a part of love. That's a part of the concept and, and exercise of love. 
And so we can understand more about God from our understanding of that. About two and a half years ago, uh, I, I went to, uh, I never did too much of this undergrad. I was one of those book nerds that spend most of my time in the library working on stuff. Um, but if, if, only, if only I would have dedicated my time to like engineering or something, you know, I'd have good money. But I went to a birthday party of this one friend. You know, he was finishing up. He was going to be, you know, getting out into ministry. So I went to his birthday party. And all I can remember about that is there is this one girl, and I thought, my goodness, this must be the vainest woman I've ever seen in my life. And those of you who had read Proverbs are going to recognize that's a compliment. But I thought, man, you know, she must, like, you know, have a guy or something. Now, you know, she was still single. Now, later on, nothing, nothing came of it then, but the next, the next semester, you know, first year as a GA, I'm thinking I'm starting seminary, fresh starts, all this stuff, and she stayed for uh, grad school as well. And God worked it out, so I kept running into her. Everywhere I went, I just kept running into her. I'd be, like, shopping the commons, and lo and behold, she'd be walking through the library, and boom, it'd just be right there. I just run into her. Kept running into her, and I uh, got to talking to her a little bit. And eventually, I was able to go out, and it, it, was, it was funny. We, we both went to the same Christian service, and so I thought, okay, let's, let's go somewhere with all the Christian service people. You know, we do this Bible club, so, you know, let's go to a park, you know, after— after uh, a time of Bible club. And so we get all this stuff together. We're going to go. Two of the people, something comes up, and their supervisor calls, you can't come, you need to go work. And my sister is going to come, and she got sick, like really sick. And so it's just me and her. So, okay, we'll, we'll go have a picnic. So here I am with this, you know, very, very attractive, nice-looking girl. And I'm thinking, okay, you know, I'll get to talk to her a little bit. And it was the first time in my life where I honestly felt completely comfortable that, I mean, that's the best way I could express it. I was just totally comfortable. But God has given me a specific calling. I'm going to go plant a church in Seattle. And, and God has spe- given her a specific calling, more towards, you know, missions and stuff, and um, like foreign missions and stuff. And so diff- different directions. And so you can recognize, okay, you know, apply, apply the mind to this. God's sending us different ways, and, and, that's, and that's great. Uh, and I, I really praise the Lord for that. I really admire ladies who are willing to accept leading from God and start heading a direction. Uh, that is definitely something um, that is uh, noble. But it was, it was kind of a hard thing for me to go through because, you know, there, there's, you're, I think you'll understand when I say this, there's nothing like that. It is unique. It, it is something that is somewhat different within the experiences of man. You know when you've got it. When you're a kid and you're like, what's it like? You know, Dad, when did you meet Mom? What's that like? He's not going to understand. You don't understand until you go through it. And, and God let me go through it. And I was like, God, why did you let me do this if you're sending us different places? Like, what on earth, God? You're not the author of confusion. I'm like Job here, you know, suffering my emotional trauma. Like, my goodness, like my life is that bad. But, you know, God in heaven was saying, John, I have something I want to teach you. That's something I want you to learn about me and about my love. And so as we see in this verse, it says, For God so loved the world. You know, affection is overwhelming. Affection kind of has this tendency to overrule other emotions. Um, think, of, think of Jacob in the Old Testament. You know, he, he leaves... His brother is trying to kill him, you know, to go back to um, some relatives, friends that they knew, and he sees Rachel. And, you know, not once, not once does it say he builds an altar, he sees God, any of that. No, he's just, wow, well, look at this person, I want to marry her. And so, you know, goes to Laban, works it out, works seven years, and doesn't even notice the seven years go by. Why? Because he loves her. So that's the affection sort of love. And... You know, even after he gets Leah, he works for another seven years. You know, it kind of, it kind of overrules uh, other emotions to a degree. Now, we know in God, God, no emotions, no aspects of the personhood of God overwhelm any other aspect. You know, God is completely transcendent. But, you know, within, within the concept of affection is, is a concept of, of, of fullness, of, you know, a, an excess, an, an extreme of that. Um, you know, it's something that, you know, sometimes it can be a negative, but I think it's a positive to be able to experience that. I think it's, I think it's a good thing that, that God's given us. But do you realize 
The way that God loves us is a complete and a full love. And we think, how even with sin could God still love us? To a degree, and I'm very careful when I say this, but to a degree, there is almost an overruling of emotion. Uh, as we experience, I think, you know, so with God, uh, that there are, you know, there are truths we just can't fathom. Like, why would God love us and seek fellowship and restoration after we had fallen into sin? Why, why wouldn't he just give up? I mean, why wouldn't, it, why wouldn't he be like the, the God the deists assume to be, where he just kind of set stuff in motion and then left, and he doesn't really care about us anymore? Because he loves you. Because he loves us. That's why he seeks us. So affection is overwhelming. We see, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Affection causes you to act unreasonably. And this is, this is one of the reasons why you know, this aspect of love gets so much flack because all of these preachers have been counselors in camp and they have, they have maybe been youth pastors or they have dealt with young people and they think, my goodness, why won't this guy listen? You know, you have like all the, all the you know, children looking at, um, I think it's uh, Elisha, you know, go up thou bald head and he's thinking, go up thou bonehead, you know, because this kid just won't listen to reason. You know, he's trying to give him guidance. It's like, okay, here comes this teenager. And he's like, I met this girl. And, you know, I just, I just, I just want some, you know, some help from you, Pastor. And in his mind, the, the kid's thinking this is all going to work out and this is God's will for my life. But I'm just here to, you know, go to my counselor like I'm supposed to. I'm getting, you know, multitude of counselors because surely they're going to tell me the same thing. Because, you know, I just feel it. And this is just real. And, you know, we're, we're just going to do it. And he's like, well, well, what kind of family is she from? You know, what, what, what are her expectations of stuff? You know, how mature are you? Are you ready for a relationship? And the person is thinking, of course I am. There are no problems. Everything's great. This is going to work perfectly. And, and, and the guy say, you, you know, you can't see all the red flags, issues. You need to be careful about this. You know, parents sometimes with their kids are like, you know, what are you thinking? It's like, slow down, pull back. And you're trying to like restrain them because you look at them and it's like, you're running off a cliff here. Why are you doing this? You know, you look, look at an um, you know, example in the Bible, Samson. I mean, my goodness, a guy that is given this tremendous strength from the Lord to be a deliverer. And he gets completely, you know, taken off the rails because of Delilah, because he looks at this woman is like, okay, I, I love this woman. Get me that woman. And they're like, you don't want to marry someone who doesn't care about God. You know, she's just going to hurt your relationship with God. She's not going to be a good partner. He's like, no, no, I, I want it. We're going to do it. And lo and behold, he ends up bald and weak and blind. And he recognizes that was not the best idea. But, you know, he did something that was unreasonable. Why? Affection. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Why? Why would he give his son? We don't deserve that. He's God. He's perfect. He's never done anything. And Jesus came to earth and lived a perfect life. He never did anything. He was totally innocent. And it's not that he's like innocent because he's up on a pole living somewhere. Like, you know, we have this some monastic idea, like because he just avoided the world. You know, that's why he's the pure spotless lamb of God. No, he went to people who are lepers and ministered to them. Every time someone came to him with a problem, he helped them and he healed people and he taught people and he cared about people. And God says he's going to die for everyone's sin. Why? It doesn't make sense. It's not reasonable. Why? For God so loved the world. You know, we ask ourselves the question, why? You know, there must be a reason for this. I want to understand. There doesn't have to be. You go to some teenager who's just acting impulsively. Are they going to be able to give you some logical reason for why they're doing what they're doing? No, just because. 
just because. And it doesn't make sense. Well, you know, God's a person. And God loves us. Now, God has reasons and his ways are far beyond our ways. But we have to stop and we have to recognize and we have to appreciate that God loves us. We have to recognize that, you know, the, this love causes people to, you know, affection causes people to act unreasonably. Welcome, welcome to life. Uh, you know, we don't always have a, a reason for everything. We can't always, you know, put something in a category. Um, sometimes we, we, we don't always have a, a clear explanation for things. I think love is enough of a reason for recognizing what God has done. You know, throughout the Bible, it, it, it you know, we're... You know, we're approaching the study because we're trying to learn more about the love of God. But the love of God, it's trying, to unle- it's trying to learn something that's unlearnable. It's trying to grasp the breadth of something, breadth of something that is, you know, too broad for any human understanding. But we're trying to, we're trying to go from the known, what we experience, to the unknown. There are aspects of that that don't carry over. But I certainly think, because uh, we can recognize there are parts of affection that just seem unreasonable, and there's an aspect of that that is within the scope of God's love. It says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Now, there is something that is implied by that, but whosoever believeth. You know, not everyone believes. I'm sure you experience that. You walk through Walmart, and it's not like walking through church. There are plenty of people at Walmart who do not care about God, do not acknowledge his existence even. That that's, it kind of baffles my mind how someone could even claim that to just completely deny the existence of God. Uh, but there's you know, a process people go through to get there. But, you know, affection, this is one of the, this is one of the you know, sad drama parts of you know, the human experience. Affection is often one-sided. You know, it's possible for someone to reach that state and look at someone else and say, wow, I love this person, and they don't share the same feelings. You know, that's probably one of the more painful, emotionally painful experiences that a human being can go through, at least if you're thinking of like a positive emotion like love causing that. It's often one-sided. Now, now think back for a moment to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. They have this perfect environment. You know, everything's great there. You know, Adam, he can you know, dress all the, all the plants, take care of the garden. Uh, and you know, they're working there. It's, it's great. They have all this stuff to eat. And they make a choice, a deliberate choice, to reject the Word of God and to choose what they want. And when you go back and look at that, what do you find? you find this verse expressed and vindicated because you do not see Adam walking through the garden in the cool of day saying, you know, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Where are you, God? We walk with each other. Where are you? Why aren't you here? No, the, the one that the Bible says thou art of purer eyes than to behold iniquity, the one that it says that thou will in no wise, um, you know, for, will in no wise pardon the, the guilty, but, you know, visit their iniquity upon the, you know, of the fathers upon the third and fourth generation. The one that it says is, is perfectly just, that, you know, meets out the wages of death that is sin, is walking through the garden saying, Adam, where art thou? When mankind fell and we were separated, and, and we experience this with our own sin even today. When we sin, it, it hurts our desire to seek God. They're hiding from God, but God is not hiding from them. God is still there. God is seeking him. God is looking for Adam. You know, when that, that person that maybe was put on your heart, that you know, moved in close to you, or maybe there's someone you ran into in a, in a business relationship, uh, maybe they're an old friend, uh, but someone you knew that didn't know the Lord, 
that for maybe, for maybe a while, maybe a couple months, maybe a couple years, you prayed and you said, God, I want this person to be saved. Give me an opportunity to talk to them that we've just forgotten or written off, kind of stopped thinking about, not really concerned for it. We've moved on. God has never stopped thinking about them. God has never stopped working in their life in, in small and big ways to try to get a hold of their heart to try to bring them back to a relationship with himself, to try to bring them into fellowship with him because he loves them. You see, love is something, love is an emotion that's wonderful. Love is something that you know, I'm sure, it's especially for everyone here that's married, you can recognize the aspect of, you know, kind of the long-term love. Uh, and there's something great that, uh, that that brings. But affection is love, too. Affection is natural within humanity that was created within the image of God. And affection gives us a little glimpse, a little bit deeper, into the love of God, into, into the love that he has. Now, we recognize, at least within the practice of man, you know, there's, you know, God says be angry and sin not. So even in anger, there's a positive use for it. But we recognize within emotion, we say, you know, this is something that just, you know, takes adolescence and just, you know, in the emotional roller coaster of that, you know, age that they're in, it just, you know, throws them for a loop, you know, sends them through the loop on the roller coaster and on their way, makes them make, you know, dumb decisions. But it's a natural course of, of our human life, of our experience. You know, it's something that we recognize. And, and if you've experienced it, you realize it is overwhelming. You know, it just kind of takes your priorities and your other emotions, your, your thoughts, you know, how, how you approach life. And it kind of bends it to the focus of that affection. We, we recognize that it, it causes you to act unreasonably. You know, it'll, it'll, It'll shut off a little portion of your brain and, and you know, make you do stuff. You think, you wouldn't, ah, I don't know if I'd normally do that. And that's something I guess we more, uh, you know, look at other people and think, why are you doing that? But, you know, it makes you do that. It makes you do things that aren't the most reasonable. And it's something that is, sadly, very often one-sided. It does not, because there is affection on one side and on one party, it does not necessitate that there is on the other side. But you know, it's still just as powerful on the side that has it. This is a portion of the love that God has for us. Well, well what's our response? We look at this and it's like, okay, for God to love the world, well, well, he gave. And, you know, maybe we look at that and say, well, I've already believed as well. So check the verse off. But stop and think for a minute. For God so loved the world. Look at the whole picture of this. Jesus was coming back to bring people back to himself, to bring people back to fellowship. For God so loved the world and is, is seeking to restore that. For God so loved the world, love him back. From Genesis to Revelation, from the beginning to the end, everywhere in between, we can see a story that... Almost any Bible scholar you ask, what's the theme of the Bible? The redemption of man, the, the character of God, and how that's all working together. God seeking to bring mankind back to the place where he was in the garden, walking with his creator in fellowship. You know, here, here in the Gospels where we see Jesus himself on earth, he's saying the same thing. Why am I here? I'm here to seek that which was lost and to save it and to bring it back to the fold. I'm here to have a relationship, to walk uh, with my children. You look, you look to the future, you look to revelation, and the eternal state that we have is not everyone's going to have their own mansion, and you're going to have all these blessings, and you know, this fruit from the tree of life, and you know, this great river and stuff that's there, and all oh, the streets of gold, everything, and it's like we look through all these discussions, boys, you know, it's like the American dream, you know, like in heaven, some celestial dream, whatever it is, you know, we're going to go live there, and it's going to be great, we're going to have this stuff. No, you look at all the things it says, and it says, I will be among them. I will be their God. They will be my people. I will be there. They will be with me, and it will last that way forever. We shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. 
We'll finally get to see him. We'll get to be with him. And that's never going to stop. God takes in past, present, and future at a glance. That to God is his desire. It's like when you're away from home. I experienced that. I live in Georgia. I'm not there right now. You know, every time I go home, I, I, it feels almost a little sweeter to me. There's a couple of people in here that are still younger. Appreciate it now. You're not going to appreciate it now that much. But appreciate it as much as you can. Because, you know, when you're away, there, you know, you miss it. Because you know, you're aware, you experience the fullness of home. The fellowship that it brings. See, God, it says in the Bible, has already, you know, when we got saved elsewhere in John, it says, you know, it came so that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Eternal life started the minute you got saved. The moment you said, God saved me. Now, I'm a sinner. You know, there is no way that I can be saved except from God. Save me. Boom. You have eternal life. Meaning the future presence of God, you can step into that today. You can pray and go right to the throne room of God, right to your Abba Father, right to the master creator of the universe. And not only go for petition, not only go for wisdom, but go for fellowship. But go because you love him. Because there's access. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. It's just a reminder of something we know, but we forget. God loves you. A reminder that we need to do that which we often forget and love him back. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you so much for your great love, uh, which you have demonstrated to us. Uh, you've demonstrated to us through Christ. God, we, uh, we love you because you first loved us. God, we, we can never fully understand or appreciate the, the magnitude or the greatness of your love. But God, I pray that you'd give us just a, a, a little, uh, an, another glimpse, a little deeper understanding uh, of the love that you have towards us, God, so that we cherish it more, so that we'd appreciate it, God, so that it would draw us to action, back to fellowship, back to the place where we would actively love you back, go to your presence. Thank you for being who you are and just enjoy you. God, thank you for loving the world and sending your son and, and giving us an open door to fellowship. Let us go through that door and enjoy that fellowship, uh, even before we get to heaven, every day here. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You are dismissed.